Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Judy Garland in Cinderella on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Cohen. Gentlemen, this is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present our own dramatized version of one of the world's best-known stories, Cinderella. Nobody knows who wrote Cinderella. Perhaps people made it up. People who for thousands of years have wished for good luck and that their dreams would come true. Anyhow, the Cinderella story in one form or another has been told countless times. So we tonight are in good company. Especially because to star as Cinderella, we have chosen one of Hollywood's most adorable actresses, Judy Garland. And now a word about Hallmark cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of Cinderella. There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back, well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse presents Cinderella, starring Judy Garland. Surely the spirit of Cinderella belongs as much in our own day as in the past. For we still have pumpkins, princes, fancy dress balls, wicked stepmothers. Although, I must say, the glass slipper craze is somewhat on the way. So Cinderella is not necessarily a child from the misty days of Shakespeare or King Arthur. She might be that attractively modern young lady you see walking into McCloskey's shoe store. May I help you? Uh, I'd like a pair of shoes exactly like the ones I have on. Well, frankly, miss, I can't tell just what style these are. They're so worn down, I really can't Well, tell. I suppose you think I don't have any better shoes to wear. Oh, no, I didn't say that. No doubt you've heard of Lucinda Brown, the well-known woman novelist. Uh, I can't say that I have. Is that one of your own books you've got there? No. Uh, oh, please don't look at that. Cinderella. Uh, I'm, I'm just reading it for research. Oh, I've got nothing against Cinderella. Yeah, I, I can't quite read your size, Miss Brown. Four double A. Oh, be careful. Don't poke your finger through the sole. This right one is a little thin. Well, let's see now. I think I can give you a pretty good match. Uh, yes. You know, it isn't every day I get to try a shoe on a well-known novelist. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not really such a well-known novelist. Not yet, anyway. You will be. I'm sure of it. You've got a light inside you. A light? Yes, it shines right out through your eyes. <laughs> Is that so? Well, what a perfectly nice thing to say. I'll take these shoes. Fine. They're a bargain, too. Six dollars and forty cents. Six dollars? Oh, but they they used to be only three-something. Well, I guess you'll have to charge it. We have to clear these things through our credit department. You mean Lucinda Brown's credit isn't good? Oh, I didn't say that. I guess that makes it pretty clear where I stand with McCloskey's shoe store. Miss Brown, if you... I would wait. sooner go barefoot than give you $6.40 for this ratty pair of Oxfords. And when my name is mentioned in the same breath with Ernest Hemingway, I assure you both of us will take our shoe business elsewhere. Good day. Miss Brown, you're still wearing one of our ratty Oxfords. Oh. I beg your pardon. Well, I... Oh, dear. It's not raining. I'm afraid it is. Your feet will be soaked in these old shoes. Oh, to tell you the truth, Mr... The guys around the shoe store call me Joe. Joe, you were perfectly right not to let me charge these shoes. I'm practically... Well, I had a story I was sure they'd buy for Real Romances magazine. But the editor says they want sordid realism. 
Everything I write seems to come out like Cinderella. And that's why you're reading it? Well, I've got to find out what I'm writing wrong so I can write something right instead of subconsciously stealing from Cinderella. Tell me, couldn't I buy just one shoe? Uh, well, you see, I think I can just about make $3.20. We can't break up there. Uh, here, pair. take the money. Uh, just a minute, Miss uh, Brown. You're awfully nice, Joe. Goodbye. Hey, hey, come back with that shoe. You know what you are, Lucinda? You're a thief. Oh, no, you're not, Lucinda. You paid for what you took. The shoes were $6.40 a pair. You gave the man $3.20 for one. Besides, you left your old shoe. That's honest. Well, sort of honest. No, it's not, Lucinda. That nice young man in the shoe store is going to get into terrible trouble on account of you. You stole from him. The same as you've stolen from Cinderella. Oh, nonsense. How can I steal from a story I've never read? Until now. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Cinderella. And she lived with her stepmother and two stepsisters who made her fetch and carry and do all the drudgery about the house. Oh, poor Cinderella. I know exactly how she must have felt. Cinderella! Yes, stepmother? Did you bring in the wood and sweep the mat? Yes. Polish the floor and feed the cat? Yes. And sew the plume on your sister's hat? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have time for that. Oh, lazy girl. And what have you been doing with your time? Well, I cleaned the garden and swept the hall, washed the dishes, wound the clock, and beat the carpets from wall to wall, and, and stitched the hem in your Sunday frock. What neglected the plume for your sister's hat? Why, I guess I just couldn't find time for that. Cinderella, come up here and button my shoe. When Bella, your sister, calls, what do you do? Cinderella, come over and button mine, too. Gisella is calling. Now go to her. Shoo. I, I can't go to both of them. What shall I do? Don't stand there as if you were nailed to the floor. I wish someone's knocking. Go answer the door. Coming. I'm coming. Hello. I have a message from the king. From the king? He requests the presence of the ladies of this household at a ball. A ball? In honor of the king's son. For the prince of the kingdom? Oh, how purely divine. The music commences quite promptly at nine. His majesty asks you to RSVP. Please tell him that we have responded. Merci. Who was it, Cinderella? It was a messenger from the king. Oh. Did I hear you say we were invited to a grand ball? Yes, for the king's son. Oh, how utterly, utterly romantic. The prince is a bachelor, you know. And perhaps if we frill you with ruffles and lace, his highness won't bother to look at your face. Mother! Though I hate to admit it, there isn't a doubt you both were in hiding when looks were passed out. But we'll deck you with diamonds and sapphires and such. And none at the ball will be prettier. Much. Stepmother? Well, what is it, Cinderella? What should I wear to the ball? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come as you are? We cannot be bothered by poor Cinderellas who think they're entitled to dress just as well as their sisters, who never do housework at all. Oh. Oh, now hurry up, girls. We'll be late for the ball. <laughs> that I really could go. And I wish I could wish it were honestly so. Wishing will make it so. Just keep on wishing and care will go. Are the dreams we dream when we're away? The curtain of night will pause. 
Tom says. But it isn't so. Heavenly days and fiddly do. What in the world's the matter with you? Oh, I... I didn't mean to be crying, so I, I'm sorry. Who are you? I could give you three guesses and give you another, but you never would guess. I'm your fairy godmother. Oh, you couldn't have fooled me. I guessed you were that from the shape of your comical, conical hat. You don't think I look like a witch? Oh, not at all. The witches and I are always getting each other's mail, you know. Oh, how sad. The postman who brings us our mail never bothers to tell witches witches from fairy godmothers. Oh, but enough of this chit-chat and sociable chinning. Tell me, why do you cry when you ought to be grinning? Well, fairy godmother, I wanted so much to go to the prince's ball at the royal palace. But my stepmother says I'm nothing but a scullery maid to be kept in the kitchen. Duck, duck, disc, disc, and a double poo-poo. I know positively a plan that will do. Now stand very tall on the tips of your toes. We'll see what my magic can do for your clothes. I'll flourish my wand with a fiddle dig dee abracadabra and the ETC. Oh, I feel quizzical, dizzical. What have you done? Look in the looking glass. That will be fun. It is you, little cinder girl, dressed for the ball. Oh, Giselle and, and Bella won't know me at all. <laughs> uh, but how shall I get to the royal palace, good fairy godmother? Oh, oh, I forgot all about that. Do you have a pumpkin handy? Uh, well, he here's a plump pumpkin I've saved for a pie. I'll make it into a coach in a blink of an eye. Oh, oh, I'd never believe it. Oh, golden inside. You don't have to believe it. Just climb in and ride. Uh, but uh, who will draw the carriage? My wand will invite a few magical forces to alter these mice into six prancing horses. Oh, let me see. I should give you a coachman or two with livery and wings. Oh, these lizards will do. With a driver that's fat and a fishman that's lean, you'll arrive in a style that's befitting a queen. Uh, one thing, fairy godmother. Is it discreet to dance at a ball with no shoes on my feet? What? Oh, did I forget the shoes? Oh, dear, 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 dear. How careless of me. I'll give you some footwear that none can surpass. Two exquisite slippers of crystalline glass. I can scarcely believe what I see with my eyes. Pray, how did you get them exactly my size? I made all my wishes completely come true. Wishing has made it so by merely wishing that I could go where I have dreamed I could be, seemed I could be dancing in the Yes, fairy godmother. The magic will last until midnight, and then your gown will be tattered and patches again. <gasps> your horses and coachman and carriage, my dear, at the twelfth stroke of midnight, will all disappear. I promise you, fairy godmother, I'll leave the palace before midnight. And thank you for all of your kindness. Thank you from the very bottom of my heart.
second act of Cinderella, starring Judy Garland. I'm sure you'll agree there are a great many letters and even just notes that you'd like to write but just never get around to writing. It's because it isn't easy to express many of the thoughts we would like to convey. Cards have made it easy for us to carry out our friendly impulses, easy to say the gracious word to send a kindly message. For they have created personal greetings. They have put into words the thoughts and feelings that are often so difficult to express. For each friend, each loved one, for each occasion, there is a Hallmark card to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And the makers of Hallmark cards realize that we buy greeting cards only to send to others. For ourselves, we might be content with less, but for our friends, only the best will do. So all Hallmark cards are created to one standard, only the finest of paper and craftsmanship, only the most beautiful colors, only the perfect words. And people know this. Just ask your friends, as I've asked mine, what name they think of in greeting cards when they want to send the very best. See if they don't answer immediately. Hallmark cards. They look for that hallmark on the back of every card because they care enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of Cinderella, starring Judy Garland. While the rain pours down outside the window of her little walk-up flat, Lucinda Brown is curled up on her bed, wearing one old shoe and one new. She is reading with deep attention, not one of her own stories, which nobody ever buys, but an adventure that will delight the world as long as there are children in it. The story of Cinderella. At the royal palace, Cinderella climbed up the great spiral staircase her little glass slippers seemed to tinkle a tune against the marble steps. At the top of the staircase, she heard the swell of music from the ball. But when Cinderella entered the ballroom, everything stopped. All of the guests in the ballroom were speechless with awe at the lovely and delicate princess they saw. Cinderella, for her part, was just as impressed, for she'd never seen people so fancily dressed. There were elegant earls and debonair dukes, sporting the latest in powdered perukes, baronets' coronets, princesses' crowns, the marquises' smiles, and the dowagers' frowns. She caught just that glimpse of Gisella and Bella, who never suspected their maid Cinderella had blossomed so bravely from cinders and shyness. Oh, look. That must be the young prince. It's his highness. Cinderella was quite terrified, for she'd never met a prince, and she didn't have even the slightest idea of what to do. So she sank to her knees in a curtsy of loyalty, exactly what young girls should do before royalty. Good evening, Your Highness. May I have the pleasure of this dance with you? I shall be deeply honored, Your Highness. Let the music commence. You waltz quite divinely. May I say the same? I'll tell you quite frankly, I'm glad that you came. Though I'm sorry to say that I don't know your name. Oh, dear. For this evening, I think I must pass as the princess whose slippers are made out of glass. Are you enjoying yourself, little princess? Oh, yes. And everything pleases you? Your party, I, I cannot describe how sublime it is. But tell me, I beg you, exactly what time it is. Only ten after ten. And time for another dance. I trust you're not tired. Oh, it's perfectly heaven. Uh, but what is the time? Why, it's scarcely 11. Come dance and romance with me, lovable lass. Little princess whose slippers are made out of glass. What's that? Just the clock at the top of the tower. Striking 12? Why so frightened of midnight? Oh, the hour I must go. God be with you. And, and, and thank you for all of the gladness and glory I've had at the ball. Wait, wait. The princess. My slipper. Come back, 
little princess. Come back! I can't understand why my princess has fled. And here in the road, there's an old pumpkin head and some mice and a lizard that scamper away. And one tiny slipper, size four double A. Oh, your highness, you honor us with this visit. Dear ladies, were you present at the ball last night? Yes, indeed. Oh, of course we were there. We were there. This little glass slipper was dropped on the stairs. Oh? The princess who wore it delighted my eyes, but she's quite disappeared. Would you try it for size? For the girl who can wear it will dance at my side, my beautiful, beautiful princess and bride. Bella, pull your toes together and make the shoe fit. All right, Mother. Uh, harder, harder. Uh, I'm sorry, dear Mother. My foot just won't go in. Oh. The slipper's so tiny, I can't get my toe in. Oh. Then fold up your arches, Gisela, and squeeze. Squeeze! I'm sorry, dear ladies. This squeezing won't do. Oh. If the shoe fits the foot, then the foot fits the shoe. Oh, how sad that my daughters should both be denied a seat on a throne. Cause their feet are too wide. I take it there are no other young ladies in this household? There's Cinderella. Who? Our kitchen maid. She'd cover you over with cinder dust. Even so, my dear lady, I think I should try the shoe on her foot. Not a chance must slip by. She sleeps in her room at the top of the stairs. With your kindest permission, I'll look for her there. And so the prince climbed the steep stairs to the garret room where Cinderella slept. And he knocked on the door... Miss Brown. Lucinda? But, but I'm just coming to the best part of the story. But I've got something for you. Let me come in. Well, who is it? It's Joe from McCloskey's shoe store. Oh. Oh, excuse me, Joe. Uh, Hello. Come in. Thank you. You, you know the funniest thing? I, I was reading Cinderella where the prince comes to try the glass slipper on her foot, you know, and he knocks on the door, and just then you knock. Well, I don't have a glass slipper, but I do have a shoe that you can see straight through. <laughs> How, how'd you find me? Just like the prince in your story from your shoe. Look. Oh, the rejection slip from Real Romances magazine. I, I stuffed that inside my shoe to keep my stocking off the sidewalk. It's lucky the editor had your address on the rejection slip. You see... I wanted to give you the other new shoe. Oh, you can't. you get in trouble. What will Mr. McCloskey say? Miss Brown, I've got some news for you. I'm Mr. McCloskey. No. The junior. And it seems to me you ought to stop writing Cinderella stories. It's a lot more fun living them. How can I? First of all, let me call you Cindy instead of Miss Lucinda Brown. All right. And then appoint me your private and personal Prince Charming with the exclusive right to take you dancing on Thursday nights, which this just happens to be. Oh, I'd love to, Your Highness. You know, I was beginning to think that stories like Cinderella were strictly once upon a time. But I guess a girl can still find a Prince Charming nowadays, even in a shoe store. And you never can tell how a thing like this will wind up. Oh, yes. Yes, you can. These stories always end the same way. And they live happily ever after. something eternally young and lovable about the story of Cinderella. We can read it or hear it, and then go back to our workaday world with renewed spirits. Not outwardly changed, but with a little softer expression around our eyes, a little warmer glow in our hearts. It's the same with greeting cards. 
They bring a lift to the heart and spirit that's as refreshing as a child's flight into fairyland. Because they show that someone cares, we can face whatever lies before us with renewed faith and courage. That's why greeting cards have come to mean so much to Americans. We're a busy people, an impulsive people, and a friendly people. And so we find greeting cards to our liking. For many years now, the American people have singled out Hallmark cards for a special liking. Perhaps because they do say what we want to say, the way we want to say it. And that's why so many folks recognize that Hallmark on the back of a card means you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Judy, what an enchanting Cinderella you were tonight. Thank you. Oh, you're very nice to say so, Mr. Hilton. I was thrilled when I was asked to play Cinderella on the Hallmark Playhouse tonight. You know, I've always felt I got my first big break in The Wizard of Oz, and ever since then I've loved playing in fantasy. And how well I remember your singing that wonderful song over the rainbow. You were just a little girl then, Judy. <laughs> well, I guess I still feel like that sometimes. For instance, whenever I buy one of your Hallmark cards, I always pick out the ones that are whimsical and gay. I just think they're more fun. Oh, and that reminds me, tomorrow I must get a card of congratulations to send to one Mr. James Hilton. To me, Judy? Yes, sir. I just heard your new book, Morning Journey, will be off the press February 20th. So congratulations are certainly in order. Well, thank you, and uh, you'll make sure it's a Hallmark card, won't you, Judy? <laughs> you can bet on that, Mr. Hilton. Now, tell us, what have you planned for the Hallmark Playhouse next week? Next week on Washington's birthday, we shall present Maxwell Anderson's celebrated play, Valley Forge which so aptly portrays the courage and vision of the father of our country. And as our star, we are happy indeed to welcome back to the Hallmark Playhouse that very fine actor, Van Heflin. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our story tonight was dramatized by Lawrence and Lee. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Joe, our Prince Charming tonight, was played by Whitfield Connor. The fairy godmother was Verna Felton. Eleanor Audley was the stepmother, and our stepdaughters were Sarah Berner and Mary Jane Croft. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Van Heflin in Maxwell Anderson's Valley Forge. In the week following, Booth Toggington's Monsieur Beaucaire, starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. And in the weeks to follow, Laura Ingalls Wilder's The Long Winter on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.